What is going on folks? Today I'm going to be showing you a special edition DIY project video where I will be going over the complete easiest guide yet on building your own arcade using a Raspberry Pi 3. So this project is going to be two parts. This one being part one where I go over all the electronics you'll need to buy, how to set everything up, how to build a control board, and then part two will be building the actual cabinet and implementing what we accomplish in this video. Now the budget for this will be a little more than what I usually spend on a project, but considering the staggering costs of gaming consoles and games these days, you'll be saving a ton of money. Plus you'll be able to order everything you need off of one site, and I'll show you how to save a few bucks along the way. Now keep in mind though, I'm not being paid or sponsored by any of these products or sites, it's just what I prefer to use because it's worked well for me in the past. You can easily switch out parts however you see fit, and fair warning, this is not a traditional build. It is a very easy, very straightforward beginner's guide to making your own arcade. So if you are a traditionalist, I highly recommend you not watch. But to get started, I'm going to do some shopping. So first thing you want to get is a Raspberry Pi 3. Definitely look for one that has a power cable and a case. This one here is only $50, so I'll add that to my cart. Now you want to get a micro SD card. I recommend getting one that's a popular brand and at least 32 gigabytes and comes with a little SD card adapter. This is also a good opportunity to check and see if you have an SD card reader on your computer already. If not, they're very cheap and can be purchased here as well. Just look up SD card reader and find one you like. Next you'll need arcade controls. A quick search came up with a few good options. These here are only $20 and come in different colors as well as wires and a little chip that converts the buttons to USB. I'm going to buy two so my arcade can be two players. And hey, check it out, free shipping. If you prefer to have different controls, feel free to shop around. Just make sure you get a chip that you can plug the buttons into that will lead to a USB cord. A few people use iPad 2 controllers, but they're a little pricey and confusing to set up in my opinion. Now before you check out, the next thing you'll need is a screen to play the games on. For this you can use a computer monitor or a small TV, which you can buy new, but they are easy and cheap to find locally through thrift stores or apps like Let It Go, OfferUp, Craigslist, or even the Facebook Marketplace, which is what I prefer since you can see who's selling the product. So a quick search brought up a few good candidates, and I found this monitor for only 15 bucks. Now keep in mind, the size or type of screen doesn't really matter, but you will need to find out if it takes either a VGA cable or a DVI cable if it doesn't accept an HDMI, which is important because the Raspberry Pi 3 only accepts HDMI. I need a VGA converter for mine, but luckily they're inexpensive and we bought here as well. You will also need a USB drive of any capacity, a USB keyboard, and speakers. But that's everything, so go ahead and check out and let's get started putting it all together. So the first thing we can work on is getting a micro SD card ready for the RPI. Just place the micro SD card in the adapter and then slide that into your SD card reader and we're ready to go. Now before we put anything on the card, we'll need to format it from its factory settings. To do this on either Mac or PC, head over to sdcard.org slash downloads. When that loads, click on one of the download links on the left that associates with your operating system. I'm currently on a Mac, so I'll use this one, but the process will be the same for the PC. Once it downloads, it will be installed, but it's a straightforward process. Once everything is ready, run the program. You'll be shown this screen and all you have to do here is select the SD card from the dropdown, give it a name of RetroPie, and hit format. Now that it's formatted, you'll need to download the RetroPie image we'll be using to put on the card. Just head over to retropie.org.uk and once that loads, click the download link at the top and then once that page loads, you'll want to click on this button here since we purchased the RPI3. That's all we need from this site, so while that's downloading, let's also download an application that will allow us to write the image to the SD card. I'll cover PC in just a second, but while I'm still on a Mac, Google Apple Pie Baker. Find the Tweaking for All link near the top, and then click the download button. Once that downloads, run the program. You'll be presented with this screen. Simply click on the three little dots next to where it says Restore Backup. Then just navigate to the GZ file that you downloaded from the RetroPie site, and select the file. Now just hit the restore backup button and that's it. Now for Windows it's a little different but the process is still the same. After following the previous steps to download the RetroPie image as well as the SD card formatter and formatting the SD card you'll want to look up Win32 Disk Imager and find the SourceForge.net link near the top. Once that page loads click the big green download button. After it downloads you will be prompted by the setup wizard for it to install. You will also need one more program called 7-Zip. For this, just go to 7-Zip.org and click the second download link at the top. 
Once that downloads, double click the .exe file to load the program, and that's all you need there. Now just find the GZ file you downloaded from the RetroPie site, then right click the file and you should now have a 7-zip option near the top. Hover over that and select Extract Here, which will add the file where the current file already is, which in my case is the desktop. That will then give you an actual image file we will write to the SD card. So using WinDisk32 Imager, select the little folder icon on the top right and navigate to the image file and then select it. Then making sure you have your SD card selected where it says devices at the top right of the window, you can click the write button and then click yes to confirm and it will begin to write. And once that is complete, you can disconnect the SD card and now we can prepare our USB drive. This process will be the same for Mac and PC and all you need to do here is plug in the USB drive and once it loads, just delete everything off of it. Next, add a folder called RetroPie, and that's it. We won't need to add anything to it until later, so just disconnect that and we're ready to start setting up the hardware. To start, place the SD card into the RPI, then grab your screen and plug that into the wall, as well as plugging it into the RPI. Then just plug in your keyboard and then put the power supply into the RPI. After giving it a minute to boot up, it will say it has detected a gamepad, which is actually the keyboard. Now I'm gonna be using a keyboard for this step, but you can easily use a USB controller like this one that I got off eBay. If you don't plan on making an arcade and you just wanna play the games, these are a great and cheap option. But I'm just gonna be testing everything out in preparation for the arcade. Here I'm just gonna program in a few of the controls, including the arrow keys, start, select, and then the A, B, and X, Y buttons, and then skipping the rest. Now that everything is working, I'm gonna plug in the USB drive we emptied out earlier. After giving the RPI a minute to fill the USB drive with the necessary folders and directories, you can go ahead and unplug the USB drive from the RPI while keeping the RPI powered on. You will then take the USB drive and plug that into your computer so we can fill it with games. Once the USB loads, go back into the RetroPie folder you made earlier and now you will see new folders added. Just open up the ROMs folder and then this is where you'll drop in the corresponding game file to its console folder. So all we need now is to find a game to download. Now, I only recommend downloading the game for the arcades that they never produced for people to buy, or if you already own the game, but you don't have a console to play it, since they're old and they usually break. I own a copy of Super Smash TV, so I'll be showing how I get the ROM for this game, because I cannot wait to play it again. It's been many years, my console broke a long time ago, and it's not like I can go out and buy another one, or at least one that works. So let's get started. For this, just hop over to Google and type in the name of the game, the system it's on, and the acronym ROM which stands for read-only memory. In my case, it's Super Smash TV Super NES ROM. That should give you the search results you're looking for. Just click on one of the links and find the download button. It should be a zip file. Don't unzip it, but rename it to the name of the game. Then open the ROMs folder on your USB drive and place it into its corresponding console folder, which in my case is a Super NES folder. Now just disconnect your USB drive and plug it back into the RPI. After giving it a minute to load and scrolling down and select quit, then select restart. After it starts back up, just scroll over to where you see the gaming system you loaded and select it. It should boot right up, but if for some reason it doesn't work, you may have downloaded a faulty ROM file. To fix this, just go back and download another ROM file, but from a different site. And when it downloads, just rename it to something slightly different and add it the same way you did originally. You will then be able to start playing the games, but I'm gonna begin building the arcade cabinet by starting with the controls, since that will determine the width of the cabinet. Now, depending on the buttons you choose, you will have to choose a board thickness that fits. Unfortunately, the buttons I chose only allow a quarter inch material, while some other buttons allow a much thicker material, like this one I used on another project. Now for the material, I recommend MDF or hardboard, but since I'll be covering this with vinyl at some point, I'll just use a sheet of ply that I already have on hand. You will also need an 8 foot piece of 1x3 for the sides. The structure of the control board will be two 13x24 sheets that make up the top and bottom where the buttons will go. The sides will be a simple box by the 1x3s with miter joints on the front, which is optional. The sides stretch back about 22 inches, which will attach to the cabinet, but the front portion will be flush with the tops. I'll start by cutting the two sheets of 13 by 24. Now I'll cut the front piece, making sure it matches the size of the top perfectly. 
help, I'll creep up on the cut just in case I'm off by a little bit. I'll now cut the two sides at about 22 inches, making sure they only have a 45 degree cut on one end where it meets the front piece. Now I'll measure the inside length of the front piece so I can make a center brace for the back. What I'm doing here is cutting two holes for the wires to pass through later on. Now, making sure everything is square, you can start gluing and nailing everything into place. Make sure the back center brace is flush with the top panel before gluing and nailing though. Marking where it goes will help. Now I'm just going to add in another center brace for strengthening the top. While that dries, I'm going to start cutting the holes for the controls using a template I made. I'll first mark the centers with a pick and drill later. This layout may look a little weird, but it's modeled after the Super Nintendo controller with a little bit of design influence from the Raspberry Pi logo. The template doesn't include the start and select buttons, so I'll just measure a place for them at 4 inches and 6.5 and inches from the edge, while being about 4 inches from the top. Now to make the holes, you have a few options, the least expensive being the paddle bit. The larger buttons I'm using are 1 and an eighth inch thick, while the smaller ones are only an inch, which is this one here. Now a tip if you're using paddle bits, make the initial pilot hole clockwise and then scrape off the first layer counterclockwise and then finish the hole clockwise again. Doing it this way will ensure you don't damage the surrounding area, especially if you're like me and you chose a cheap ply by mistake. After you have all the holes drilled, just give it a good sanding and go grab the base. To bring them together, I'm just going to be combining wood glue and nails. After cleaning off any excess glue, I'm going to patch the holes with wood filler or spackling. Each one works just fine. While that dries, I can now cut the bottom axis panel out. This can be done a few different ways, but it won't be seen, so it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm measuring mine to be about an inch from the edge, and then making the cut with a bandsaw. I'll then attach it the same way I attached the top. Now to keep the cutout in place, I'm just using some picture frame clamps, but again, there's a few different ways you can do this, so choose what's best for you. After that's in place, I'm going to flip it over and start sanding with 80 grit, and then move up to 200 with a palm sander. And once everything is smoothed out with a 200 grit, I'm going to sand over the edges just a little bit by hand, making sure I don't burn them too badly. After that, make sure you dust it off really well and prep for the paint. I'll be using filler primer, which works really well on soft woods like this and then finishing it off with a protective enamel for a glossy finish. When you start painting, make sure you get even coats, letting it fully dry before sanding and more filling. I recommend sanding by hand with at least 300 grit. And then finally, before I put on the color, I'll sand down the primer with 600 grit, cleaning off any dust left over with a wet, fiberless towel. After the color coat fully cures, sand down any runs you may have gotten and clean with a wet rag again. Then you could put on one or two more coats after that with sanding and cleaning in between each coat. And this is definitely a step where you want to go the extra mile because the more work you put into it, the better the paint will look. Now that my final coat is cure, I'm going to install the components by starting with the joysticks. For this, just center it up with the hole, mark one of the corners, and then drill out the hole with a drill bit the same size as the bolts you're going to be using. In my case, they are quarter inch machine screws with small rounded heads. Making sure the joystick aprons are off, just drop one of the screws in the hole and then feed the stick onto the screw. And then tighten down the nut, making sure you center the joystick as well. You can then easily drill out the rest of the holes and tighten down the screws. I find it easiest to use a screwdriver on one side and a socket on the other. Now for the buttons, they're pretty self-explanatory and snap right into place. 
If for some reason the paint shrunk on the holes, just use some sandpaper to open them back up. So luckily with this kit, the wiring is insanely easy. They supplied small wires for the buttons, a ribbon cable for the joystick, a chip to plug them all into, and then a cord that plugs into the chip and then plugs into the USB port on pretty much any computer. And since it's two player, I got two of everything. To hook up the buttons, just place the red and black wires onto the button terminals. It doesn't matter which one they go on since it's just a momentary switch. What's nice about these is they snap right into place so they won't fall off accidentally. Then just plug the other end into the chip. The ribbon cable for the joystick also works exactly the same way. Now, however you order the buttons on the chip doesn't matter at all. All that matters is when you hook up the other set of controls, you plug them in the exact same way since they're the same type of controller. So the RPI will pick up one controller and when you program the one, it'll automatically program the other. Now the wires don't allow me to attach the chip to the sides with screws, so I'll need to use hot glue on the corners and attach it to the underneath side at the top. Once that dries, I'll add the final cord, which is the USB cable, and then feed it through the holes I drilled out earlier and then attach the bottom panel. Alright, so we're almost done. All we have to do now is configure the controllers to work with the RPI. To do this, just make sure it's powered on and then grab the keyboard or whatever you initially set it up with and then plug in your new controllers. And it doesn't matter which USB port they go into either. So with your keyboard, pull up the menu by hitting the button you programmed to be the start button. Now scroll down to where it says configure controls. This menu will pop up and now you can put away the keyboard and grab your new controls. Just hit any button to start the configuration. I'm going to be referencing the Super Nintendo controller to mimic its layout. All right, so now that I configured the first set of controls, the second set is automatically configured as well since I matched the wiring and it's the same controller. If anything is off by a little bit, just flip it over and make sure the wiring is good. But otherwise, you should be good to go. All right, so if everything goes well, you can now start enjoying the first and hardest part of making your own arcade. Now, if you don't have the tools, resources, or even interest in building a full arcade cabinet, you can still use all the electronic components I showed you today, but in a much smaller container, like this one I made a couple episodes ago. It doesn't even need to be this complicated either. You can literally put these controls in almost anything. All you honestly need is a drill, a couple drill bits, and a free weekend. But if you're like me and you want to make something even cooler, coming up soon I'll have part two where I build the actual cabinet to complement the controls and everything we accomplished in this video. But until then, thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Find me on Instagram and Facebook and let me know what you were able to build thanks to what you learned in this video. And I will see you in part two.